talent is the number one thing to make you win as you scale. Like having the right people around you, having new ideas, new perspective. Like I think about, you hear a lot right now in, in the market around diversity, right? And like diversity to me is something that's embedded in our DNA and not from like a tick the box motion, right? Like I don't need to have a diverse team just to, to, to tick a box on numbers, but really yep. embrace the idea that like people have different perspectives when they come from different walks of life. And I tell my team all the time, like building a great business is a lot like building or baking a cake. You know, you have your eggs and your sugar and your flour. If you're, if you don't have flour, you can't add more sugar, right? We have to go find the flour and bring it into the recipe. Like we cannot just substitute out with, um, if we had, you know, 10 members of our executive leadership team that were exact replica copies of me, we would be screwed. Like <laughs> the business would never work. All right, welcome everyone to another episode of the Jake Dunlap Show. We are very excited that you joined us. If you haven't tuned in, this is the show where we talk to celebrities, thought and industry leaders to really discover their journey to success. I am super excited that you're joining us. This show is like no other, I can promise you that. You might laugh, you might cry, but you will definitely leave inspired and gain a whole new level of insight into those people that you follow, love, and admire. All right, welcome everyone to another episode of The Jake Dunlap Show. I'm very excited. I, you know, I, I'm, I get excited for guests. We were actually just talking to. I'm also excited for, I think I'm going to take a Blade helicopter from and next time I'm in New York. I'm kind of terrified, but I think this week's guest has talked me into it. Um, this individual uh, understands the enormous pressure and demands health core organizations are under and is on a fearless mission to empower them through compliance automation. That is when he isn't playing with his kids, at the gym, cooking, uh, or fulfilling his side <laughs> hustle as donut connoisseur, which we can get into that too. I, I'm gonna have a gluten allergy, so it sucks now. Like, I can't be a connoisseur of donuts, but uh, he's recently raised a $43 million Series B uh, funding to help ease the lives of over 300,000 healthcare professionals across the US uh, as they serve their 2,500 clients. Please join me in welcoming the med trainer mastermind and the heart and soul of healthcare automation, Mr. Steve Gallion. Steve, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Jake. Thanks for having me. No problem. All right. So donut connoisseur. We'll just jump into that immediately. Like I found I found that online when I was researching you. So like yeah. what goes into a great donut? Like what is like what is like what's the DNA? That's why people are really tuning in right now. <laughs> I think that it's a wide variety. I, you know, I think that I've been stuck with this kind of um, championed title from my marketing team because of uh, lots of different uh, events that we have done. And I'm always kind of the, you know, the donut guy and <laughs> uh, whether it's, I have a thing for like boutique donut shops across, you know, as I'm traveling around for, for business or even sure. my son, my, I have a seven-year-old son and he's like every weekend is like, dad, let's get donuts. Let's get, so we, we always try like <laughs> new places. And so it's just kind of a, um, something that's been handed off to me by my team as someone <laughs> as I love being the, the, the proclaimed donut uh, connoisseur there. Yeah. But not much I more to it. it than that. Yeah. <laughs> my dad, and it's funny, me and my dad actually used to do that too when I was a kid. Uh, we would go to, for those of you who are in the Midwest, High V, which is like a <laughs> grocery store. And we would have, uh, we would eat donuts and that was the move. What's your favorite donut place in the US? You know US? what? It's like, going to sound, it's going to be like, it's going to be like so cliche, but like I'm big on consistency and knowing what I'm getting. But it, it, just to walk into like the Krispy Kreme and get a, a you know, off, Krispy the, Kreme. All right. off yeah. the line, warm, just traditional like glazed donut, but um, keep it pretty simple. I'm not too much into like the big mixtures of cereal on top and, you know, bacon and right. maple, but yeah. So I don't know. Like, like I said, a little Chris, cliche, good, good but crispy cream. But, yep. There you go. Those things are addictive, man. Yeah. Then we've got voodoo donuts, which is like the, in Austin. I got, they got one in Portland too. So uh, I always look by with envy. So, all right. So for everyone tuning in, you know, what we usually talk about is we talk about the journey of leaders and and the things that motivated them to to be in the places that they're at now. Um, so Steve, you grew up in Redlands, California in the the 80s, which I have to imagine is much different than, you know, Redlands today. So what are some of kind of the earlier members, uh, memories that you have around, you know, growing up, you know, inspiration, you know, what you were into and, you know, what led you to go into, you know, Cal Riverside too? 
Yeah. So, um, and just kind of uh, take a step back there, and it'll give a little bit of, of origin on, on my family. We ended up in that area because my father was uh, attending dental school at Loma Linda University, which is just a town right adjacent to Redlands. But Redlands is a little bit more of a um, and a little bit better of a city, I think, than than living in in right next to where the the university was there. So, um, born and raised there. I still have family there, and uh, it was a very you know, very small town feel growing up, not a lot of activity. The The city has changed pretty um, dramatically now. Um, I'm not there often, but uh, when I am, it's it's always interesting to see the growth. It used to be a big citrus community, a lot of history there, a lot of houses that are more historical and which is kind of cool, you know, things that were built in the 1800s that are still standing. And um, there's just a, a tremendous amount of uh, sense of community and a lot of people know each other, but the city has grown and it's quite a different place than, than when, when I grew up there, but uh, it's doing well. And uh, it's a lot of those community ties uh, and connective tissue to the city are still there for me. Yeah. And obviously so your dad obviously went that, that route. Like what are some memories you have around, like, again, like, Growing up, you know, obviously you're, you're, you know, running a company now, you know, uh, you know, influence from parents. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, tremendous influence. Like I, I break up mentors into kind of three different buckets, but one of them is a bucket that I call uh, uh, practical mentors. So people who directly influence you, but may not be directly related to your field of interest. So like my dad, I'll say was a practical mentor of mine. He took a traditional route, was a dentist and but I learned a lot from him and a, and a big thing, and we'll probably touch on this a little bit later, Jake, but, um, you know, later on in life, I went to law school and he was like, he was the big driver for that, not pushing me to do it, but I watched my dad go through a mid, mid, uh, life career change. So he didn't graduate dental school until he was 41. And wow. I remember watching <laughs> that. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. And it was a big inspiration. Like it wasn't too late and he just had a passion for it. Wanted to go back really, um, a lot of fun memories though during that time as like a young kid, uh, probably, you know, middle class, lower middle class at the time, dad was in school full time, mom was working as a nurse. And, you know, some of the things that I remember, which were funny, like, I would never do these with my kids now, right? Like my dad's going through lab at, at dental school, and he would bring me to the lab. And like, while he's working in the little laboratory component next to me on building wax models and doing whatever dentists do, right? Um, He'd literally give me a block of wax and like a Bunsen burner and I'm six years old and be like, you know, make stuff. <laughs> like I can't the even Bunsen imagine. Bunsen burner. Yep. There you go. I remember those things. Yeah. So good, good memories, but yeah, big inspiration for my father. And I remember when we were talking about law school, um, it was actually after the exit of my, my last company in 2013. And he's like, why the hell do you want to go to law school? I said, you know, I just have always wanted to go. I wanted to more understand more about it. And there's a little bit of a deeper story. But he goes, look, at the end of the day, because I had found a school that was at, at, at night, right? In a four-year program right. instead of a traditional three-year program. So 6 to 10 p.m. at night and um, four years straight through. And he goes, at the end of the day, four years is going to go by. And you either will end up with the degree that you wanted to chase or, you know, you'll be up to date on the latest Game of Thrones episode or whatever the, the show was that he chose. Right. And, right, and he has right, a good right. point. Like, so um, I chose to do it. There's no right time. It's kind of like having a kid, you know, that's right. when you're looking at education later in life, there's no right time to do it. And so but yeah, huge inspiration from from my father on on those grounds. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Yeah, that's I mean, uh, I can't imagine. I mean, one, I mean, what a great role model to have obviously is you know it affected you you went back and got your you know law degree which is no no small feat like out of all the ones to get right it's like you could get, could get like philosophy or something like that not yeah. not from a philosophy majors out there like that's necessarily like a walk in the park but you know law degree in particular is pretty pretty aggressive and, and how did you you know again like you know did he did he work for himself did you know did you know did you find yourself doing kind of entrepreneurial things early on or like you know, where do you feel like some of that, like, you know, kind of strike out on your own came from? Yeah. So that was kind of, I, I truly believe you're, you're almost like it's in your blood or it's not like, I, I think you can, you can teach people how to do certain things, uh, entrepreneurship, creating your own business that kind of live and die by your own sword mentality is, is something that is pretty tough to teach. And I'm not trying to knock people who are going through like entrepreneurship programs in, 
in you know in undergrad yeah, or grad school but it's see we can not we can knock it a little bit i mean like i'm, I'm okay to knock it a little bit it's like um I, most of the people that i know who um who have created good companies uh, have have done so through like practical experience less so on like what they learned in the classroom and so i guess i got into it just uh it wasn't because i really wanted to work for myself or really wanted to go out and and like change the world some people have a big passion on on creating change it was just um more around like freedom and perspective like i just wanted to be able to have the ability to do fun stuff like this sit on a podcast and and yeah. not punch a clock and you know you might work 18 hours a day but you get to choose the 18 hours that you work so that was kind of the drive and the motion yeah, that's cool. Yeah, we'll get we'll get into that. So so you go to college, and then you, but you do go to work before like there's a kind of an in between, um, you know, when you go to college, and then you're, you know, before you kind of start doing your your fully your own thing as a part of it. Um, and so you kind of you start to get into um, a few different things. I mean, you kind of start to get into like a couple different like areas, you know, again, it seems like kind of like entrepreneurship, etc. It was like, pretty early in your career. But like, what were you up to before you, you know, kind of started your first you know, company, because I know waste stream, you know, solutions, for example, you know, was really early. And that was like, you know, you kind of, you know, working with some other folks to start that, like, you know, what did you do after college? And and how did you kind of really almost immediately go into it? Because I think that that's a scary leap for a lot of people, you know, because I mean, you're like, literally a few years out of college, like doing your own thing. So, you know, like, what were you up to before? And then like, you know, how did you decide to make the leap to just, you know, go out on your own? Yeah, so I, I had always been kind of working towards doing something on my own, even while I was in undergrad. Uh, I, the very first kind of bite at the apple, so to speak, that I had with going off on my own was a company that I had built, very small and was pre-revenue in the tech space, surrounded by, uh, it was actually in the security encryption space. And that company, we, uh, when I said we, I had two business partners in that, both that went to school with me. Uh, we actually exited that free revenue early on. And it was kind of an interesting um, interesting thing because as a 21-year-old kid, and this is my first seven-figure life event, right? And uh, and it plays a big piece of my journey because 18 months later, I was just completely flat, dead broke. And it was kind of a funny, uh, I mean, not funny at the time, but I remember walking walking up to my door and it's on, uh, it's two days before Christmas. So it's the 23rd. and I have a wreath on my door. I actually use this image in, in um, sales meetings and uh, I there's a piece of paper in the wreath and it's a final foreclosure notice on my house, right? And at the time, um, it, it kind of cutting through some of the fat here, I had I was working on building waste stream solutions, um, but I was also working at Target and I'll come back to that story. But it, and I had my daughter was about to turn one years old and like I didn't know what was going to happen, but I was investing everything I had into the business and it, it almost came down to choosing and this sounds super irresponsible, right? But choosing between paying the mortgage or choosing between paying the employees at Waste Stream. Yeah. And um, I took a leap of faith on that, but it was uh, quite the journey and the job from Target came. I just needed cash flow, like personal cash flow. So I took a job of working uh, in logistics for, for Target. Uh, and that was like a 2 a.m. to 10 a.m. process. This is like the in-store logistics process. So I managed teams in stores in Target, whether they were 100 people to 300 people. And uh, after I got off work, I would drive to uh, our office, which was in Pomona, California. So I'd drive an hour there. We had rented a, a, literally a trailer for $400 a month on a dirt lot, didn't have running water <laughs> or air conditioning. And, and that was wow. really uh, humble beginnings for a waste stream solutions. But that was a that was a good, good build and that kind of parlayed into, so company one, little money to target to building company two. And so, yeah, it was really early on, like trying to get into different things and a couple of failures along the way that led to lessons learned. What do you, I mean, again, like when you think about that, like, I guess, when did you know it was time to kind of do your next thing? You know, like when was, because I think that that's it too, that, you know, sometimes I see entrepreneurs get locked in, you know, or a lot of people, I mean, again, like your dad's a good example, right? And it's like, you get yeah. locked into a career, you get locked into a company. You get locked into just various situations. And I'm sure everyone out there, whether you're an entrepreneur or not, can totally relate. You know, they might even be in a place where they feel locked in. And, and so how did you 
this is your baby, you know, again, you kind of like went through these really tough times to like, you know, make this first business, you know, successful. Like, how did you know, or like, you know, what kind of drew you to do something different? I think the the kind of the long-term success is what drew me in, whether it was, you know, uh, there's always financial motivation and financial motivation comes in a couple of different ways. I know tremendously talented CEOs that run nonprofits and their financial motivation is, is, is actually to, to finance um, things that benefit whatever the, their beneficiary group is that their nonprofits working towards, right? It's maybe different than, than mine. Um, so I think financial freedom and just personal freedom, like always was something I was chasing and really wanting to get into, um, I really wanted to build something that didn't just allow for, for, for that for me, but also gave other people opportunity. Like I think about med trainer today, having, uh, let's see, we're a little over 300 employees. Like if I just think about average families, there's probably about 1200 people that need MedTrainer to work, right? And that rely on MedTrainer to support their family. Like if you just think about people having families of four, yeah. you know, something going to be less or more, but that's, that's kind of how I think about it. Like how many people can we touch and how can we do that? And I think how that's do you, a big how, part like, of it. Where do you think that comes from? Cause that's a really unique perspective. I mean, it's like, I want it all. Give it. <laughs> I yeah. want. Yeah. I want like all this on my. Because it's you know. Because again, it's kind of like the the juxtaposition, which is a big word for me. Between you know, like you said, you talked a little bit about you know, kind of the freedom of you know, I want to work eighteen hours, but do it on my own time. But you're also, or not even a but, but and you're kind of talking also about the you know, the responsibility that comes from, a, you know, all of these people, you know, look, I run a 45 person company and, you know, we're funded by, you know, myself and profits. It's a pretty novel idea. Um, and, um, you know, I definitely can relate, but, but how do you, how do you marry those two things? Yeah, I, I think most of the exposure came like early on, I think it was more greed motivated. Like, you know, I want to buy the Ferrari or whatever. And then like after, going through this this revolution of like losing money and then going back to work at target well and like building a business after hours the people that i met along the way were probably the biggest influences there and so mm -hmm. i'll give you a little bit i'll peel back one extra layer there when, when i was at target you're managing teams um um you know early 20s master of the universe out of school like I know everything and, and the people here who don't have a college degree, know nothing like this is your thought process as, as, as often uh, someone in their really early twenties, right out of undergrad. And like really uh, what I have, have found in life, like the wrong angle to look at things from. And like, I found that success carries uh, very similar patterns when you're talking about working with people. And so I guess the passion for people began working within target meeting meeting everybody on you know a team which is highly diverse um, from race to age to gender and really getting those people to believe in you and trust you you know um yeah i'm i think that trying to convince a and i'll just pick something at random here but if i have to try to relate to a 65 year old Hispanic woman who doesn't speak English and we're working together on a team. How do you do that? How do you build that connective tissue with that person and figuring out how to be really inclusive as a leader that started in that target. There's actually an unwritten kind of rule that we have uh, at MedTrainer. You know, if somebody has worked at target more than a year and they apply, they get an interview just because I do think <laughs> that there's so, so much value in the way that they, they taught leadership there. Yeah, that's crazy. That's cool, man. Yeah, that's good. It's, I think that there's, there's those organizations out there that, you know, just instill a certain, you know, kind of ethic and, and process and that I think it's it's really difficult to to substitute. I like that. Anyone who's worked at Target for a year. So anybody listening <laughs> to this, if you're looking for a job, you know, go work at Target and then uh, Steve will hire you. Uh, not hire you, but at least give you an interview. So, all right, so let's talk about med trainer. So, you know, some of the things that I was, I was looking up ahead of time, like you know, like healthcare and obviously your dad, you know, it's kind of, you know, in, the, in that world. Um, you know, like what was the the kind of jump off point? Like I said, you know, you kind of are like still kind of waste streams in the, you know, kind of background. But you know, what was it about Med Trainer that you were like, this is my thing? You know, I'm going to start a, you know, com compliant healthcare compliance. Right? It's like I don't think anyone's like, oh, you know, 
I can't wait to be, you know, well, I don't know. I guess some people do get excited about compliance. <laughs> um, but, but like what, what made you like, you know, kind of recognize this opportunity and jump, jump into that? Yeah. So good question. So um, first thing is like family, I was always around healthcare. Like my, my dad was a dentist. My mom was a nurse practitioner. My sister, older sister's a pharmacist. Like it's always been around, but that wasn't what led me down that road. Um, I guess like I, I always thought that, uh, I, I wanted to somehow be connected to markets that were stable and predictable. And I have found that more in, in healthcare as I thought about who we want our in market to be. There's a ton of um, ton of founders and a ton of people, especially in the tech business that you'll see go from like, let's say like FinTech to healthcare technology, like, but their common denominator is, is building SaaS companies within a certain yeah, range exactly. of, you know, that, and my common denominators are are a little bit opposite. Like, how do you go from building a medical waste company, which is essentially a trash company, to building a, a software company? And um, there is actually some some connectivity there. And when I was um, exiting, well, maybe last year or so with Waste Stream Solutions, we really dove into compliance in the office. So being a healthcare waste company, there's a ton of compliance wrapped around your business to begin with. Oh, I bet, yeah. But Part of that compliance is monitoring your in customer base to make sure that they're compliant with certain regulations. And so it's very common in the medical waste industry to have uh, the waste providers giving big three ring binders of training to their customers saying, hey, here's how you train your staff on these things. And this is like similar to the timing when like red boxes started to pop up with DVDs and Blockbuster struggling and like the writing was on the wall at the consumer level. Like people are really looking for more instantaneous access to on-demand material, not thumbing through paperwork and and looking for you know these these more legacy style management systems of how they manage things. And there's just a big gap that was exposed about education, especially on the mission critical regulatory side. Like how do we educate our staff in healthcare without having to shut down the office for a half a day. Like the answer for a healthcare facility that says, oh, we don't need your software. We just shut down our office for the day and do all the training. They probably just spent ten to $20,000 doing that training because of the loss right. of revenue for you know the opportunity cost there. And so the writing was just on the wall, um, vetted it out, did some market work and saw that there was just this really big opportunity for, to build a company, especially just in the small to mid-sized healthcare market, which is where we started. And now the market is actually pulling us up market into more of the, in, into the hospital space as well. And some of the larger health systems too. Yeah. All right. So, okay. So you kind of have like an idea of the market, um, et cetera. You know, what were the early years like, you know, did you guys take funding early? Did you like, how did you like get the business off the ground? No. So, so luckily my co-founder and I, we, um, he, uh, so George Fernandez, my co-founder, he co-founded Waste Stream Solutions with me as well. And we had a pretty decent personal outcome from the exit of that company. So we bootstrapped it. And um, we originally said, we're going to take a year off. And three weeks later, we found ourselves like hand drawing out what we thought the, <laughs> the, the interface would look like sitting on a unfurnished office man. floor. Yeah. Yeah. Just, it's, a, <laughs> it's our addiction, I guess. But yeah, early years right. were, crazy struggle like we i remember pricing out the platform at like the 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 very basics like our mvp right minimal viable product that delivered into the market and like our kind of our go-to market kind of gimmick was you know a dollar a day compliance and so we started try, trying to charge 30 dollars a month for up to 15 users on this platform we couldn't sell anything like it was uh, people there is a direct psychological connection between price and value and in healthcare, um, I, I do believe that just like any buying anything else, they 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 need to feel like they're they're paying for something of value. So it wasn't until we started really testing the um, the elasticity of kind of our pricing model that we were able to figure out where kind of the sweet spot was to begin selling the product. And then um, we were specifically selling learning at that time, and our learning management okay. system was baked in content. And then it, we advanced into two other core product buckets over the years. And what, so again, so you bootstrap it, which is, yep. which is great. And then, you know, like, again, as you're, you're kind of growing and scaling, like, what are some, I guess, like, what were some of the big takeaways? Like when you look back, it's been, you know, 
been 10 years basically, you know, mm-hmm. since you started it. Like, what were like, the, you know, in the first few years as you're doing that, what were some big takeaways for you? Meaning like, you know, some big lessons learned or, you know, you think that, you know, when you kind of look back, you're like, oh man, that was stupid. Or like, I wish we would have done, it's never like, I wish we'd have done this like totally different, but you right. know, there are definitely things when you're like, you know, I probably shouldn't have done that. Oh man. I mean, there's so many moments where you look back and you like cringe and you like, I can't believe that I acted that way or did that thing that way. <laughs> uh, and not, I mean, nothing to the extreme level, but um, I think even like learning terminology around who you're selling to and like being right. confident to speak to what your problems you're trying to solve. Like there's so many mistakes along the way where I referred to the wrong thing with the wrong customer. And they're like, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and, and candidly at the time, <laughs> We did like, it, ah. right? And yeah. So um, lessons learned. I think familiar, you know, be, being familiar with your market um, for sure. The, the from the terminology to the vernacular to you know how to speak the language of that that end user, and then also um, being you know fully aware that that your customers have an opinion on how the product should be, and like you, we do have product steering committees and things like that in place. But at the time, you need those champion customers. You need the people to help you think about where you're where you have gaps in product and that doesn't mean just software it could be anything that you're building um and really getting the 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 eyes and and ears of the customer in those discussions now the other the second part to that um statement is that the customer isn't always correct on knowing what they actually need like they're they're looking to solve problems but their solution may not be the correct one so you have to really distill it down and kind of shake it out in order to, 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 to find that true product market fit, try and really come up with, with good, interesting and helpful product that drives uh, solutions to the customer's problem. Yeah. I think, you know, it's interesting there, like, and for everyone listening, you know, I feel like, you know, what you're, a lot of what you're getting at is, you know, again, it's like about knowing the customer and, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting. Sometimes I see a lot of people and especially in sales and, and marketing where, you know, they kind of jump ahead and they do that. And and a lot of the issues pop up because you spend time running the wrong direction, or you don't invest the time up front to make sure you kind of really understand, you know, what those people, you know, what, what they really need, what they want, who they are, what keeps them up at night, the vernacular, all of that. And, you know, sometimes you have to, unfortunately, sometimes the only way to learn is through messing it up. But there's other times where, you know, you definitely can kind of dive in and, and do more prep and and be ready for it. And then, you know, for you, I know, I know mentorship is big for you, you know, so yeah. like, again, as you're kind of building and scaling the company, you know, what role does mentorship play in those early years? And as the company, you know, kind of continues to mature? Yeah, so if you take it from the very beginning, you know, your mentors are probably more in that bucket of like, your, your practical mentors, or or people who inspire you for different reasons that you can um, you know, we talked about my father a little bit. I have several people that fit into that bucket. And then as you as you kind of progress, um, you'll get into more of your actual business mentors, people who are maybe more likely aligned with you. Maybe they're investors, maybe they're board members, maybe they're other CEOs, founders, people that you can lean on. This is the toughest group, by the way, to to really work with. Not because they're challenging, but as CEO, you're, uh, and it doesn't matter if you're CEO or founder or whatever your title is, right, at the time, but you, if you're the top of the food chain within the organization, you're literally asking people to donate their time to you to have discussions around things you want to learn. You, you right. can't, uh, I mean, you can go out and hire a CEO coach or those types of things. Um, and some are probably great. I've never, I've never found myself um, looking for one. Sure. I luckily have had, uh, I, I feel like the best mentors on the planet are often other founder CEOs in the portfolios. If you're taking an investment and, and you have easy access to them, like I'm blessed to have access to other founder CEOs and, and telescope partners uh, portfolios across multiple funds, as well as, you know, best equity partners portfolios, some of the largest tech companies on the planet um, are in those ecosystems. And, you know, you can learn a lot setting up uh, one-on-ones to sync up every, you know, once a month and once a quarter with, with people who've been there, done that, especially at scale. You know, I want to talk to people who have yes. seen the, seen the, um, the journey through a hundred million dollar company who started early and, and bootstrapped it or 
what what lessons that they learned. Sometimes you can shortcut your way by by learning from their 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 successes as well as their failures. Totally, right? totally. Yeah, I look back at my first VP of sales job as a VP of sales. I've been a sales leader for a while, but I've been the first VP of sales at Glassdoor, and I look back and I'm just like, God, why didn't I just go talk to more people? You know, like why didn't I? And again, I think so so often it's funny because I like to get to that point in my career. That's that's what I did. I always say it's like you know, most ideas have already been executed. Like there's very little truly original like concepts. And, you know, borrowing from other people is almost always, you know, a good starting point, right? And then at least or at least understanding perspectives is always a good starting point. And, you know, I think a lot of people, if they've ever done something before, etc, they kind of just tend to go into it. And then I think you get another type who's like, I'm gonna find someone else who's done it, or I'm gonna go to Google or YouTube. It's like, you know, I feel like Google and YouTube and, you know, how to find a mentor, are like three classes that should really be taught in college, uh, as yep. opposed to like how to just figure it all out yourself, which is what we kind of learn uh, to do. So I think it's just a, it's a, it's a great call out. And, you know, can you talk a little bit more about like the types of mentors? You know, again, you talked like, yeah. you know, like you'd had these, the, the, like, I think it's like unknown mentor, professional, practical like, you know, like, because I think this is interesting. So, because I always think about it kind of similar to what, how you were describing it, which is like, but someone who's like, I usually think someone who's like two steps ahead of where I want to be. You know, the step ahead is a little bit easier, but if you're always kind of finding the people that are two steps ahead, I think it, you know, can, can be good. But how do you think about these different types of mentors? Yeah. And so, like, this is a concept I, I came up with, right? These three buckets. And, um, the reason why I did this is I was really thinking about who touches my life and who touches my company and who touches people around me. And like, how do we, how do you engage with people around you to better yourself or better your career? And so, yeah, you, you hit the nail on the head with the kind of the hierarchy here, unknown mentors, professional, and then practical. Um, I'll start with unknown. So unknown are, you know, people who say, Oh, I always looked up to Elon Musk or Steve yeah, Jobs sure. or yeah. And the unknown is because they don't know who you are 99% of the time, right. right? I mean, you're 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 basically watching them from afar and lessons learned are unilateral. They're just things coming your direction. There's no share of knowledge back and forth to solve problems or have discussion. Um, I think this is an important group because it can help guide you on your, maybe your, your global ideology. It can help try, guide you on what markets you want to be in. Hey, look, the electric vehicle market looks really interesting to me. I think I want to do a startup there because I watched Elon Musk grow his career. I watched Lucid Motors do these things, right? And um, like you need some type of unknown mentors who you can watch from afar yeah. to gauge their success and see if that's somewhere you want to be. The next group being uh, that professional mentorship, I think I, I hit on just a few minutes ago, board members, yeah. other CEOs, things like that. People who will listen to you, donate time to you, help guide you with specific answers to specific questions. I talk to my board members at least one time per week, You know, every single one of them, sometimes more. And it's not because I'm saying, hey, I need you to come into the operation of the company and run the company for me. It's, hey, let me, let me put you, these people as a sounding board around me. Um, Better to have really smart people around you that can give you some some you know uh, real life knowledge and experience from years and years of, of of building their careers in let's say tech or investing or running right. other businesses, and then the last one being practical mentors. Those are people who can help you with mentorship across a lot of different levels. I mean, you might have conversations around, should I go to school for this, or do you think this company sounds good? I'm dealing with this problem at work. Um, I I think my uh, I don't know. I'm really feeling absent as a father because of, of so much time I'm putting into the job. Can you tell me what your experiences are like? Like these are these are things that can really help you get peace of mind and relate them back to your personal life. And I don't think that any one particular person fits into one particular right. box of those. They may be different for different people, but I think all three of those buckets for me are equally important. That's cool, man. Yeah, that's really cool. I think that that's like a really interesting way to 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 think about it and i think again all of it feels very actionable so hopefully anybody listening is like what's a mentor it's like you know well it, it, it's it's whatever you need it to be you know as a part of like for what you need or for what that that situation is so talking about kind of again like as the company's grown and scaled you know what have been some of like your biggest like learnings you know you and i were talking a little bit before about you know um people right your skill sets and why people want to work with you etc like what do you feel 
you know, over the last few years has really been like the unlock in terms of like, you know, how you've grown, how you've, you know, re retained and, uh, you know, top people and added top people. Like what's some of like the secret sauce, both for, you know, from a company and from like your skill set standpoint? Yeah. So on the skill set side first, like if I think about um, like, what am I really good at? And I think where I spike is like surrounding myself with really smart people. Like talent is the number one thing to make you win um, as you scale, like having the right people around you, having new ideas, new perspective. Like I think about, you hear a lot right now in, in the market around diversity, right? And like diversity to me is something that's embedded in our DNA and not from like a tick the box motion, right? Like I don't need to have a diverse team just to, to, to tick a box on numbers, but really yep. embrace the idea that like people have different perspectives when they come from different walks of life. And I tell my team all the time, like building a great business is a lot like building or baking a cake. You know, you have your eggs and your sugar and your flour. If you're, if you don't have flour, you can't add more sugar, right? We have to go find the flour and bring it into the recipe. Like we cannot just substitute out with, um, if we had, you know, 10 members of our executive leadership team that were exact replica copies of me, we would be screwed. Like <laughs> the business would never work. We would have to have really fresh insights. And, and, you know, that's one of the reasons I run our, our, our leadership team pretty inclusively, like a lot of hands on the wheel. We make decisions together. Ultimately, I guess uh, I end up with a veto power, so to speak, but rarely sure. have to utilize it, right? Um, because people is what drives the success. And I tell all of our new hire classes when they come in, and I really mean this, like you could, for anyone listening, they could back channel and go talk to people on LinkedIn about this. Um, but we really have an employee first, customer second, shareholder third attitude. And what does that mean? Shareholders are looking to find derivative value on their investment, right? And you cannot create that value without happy customers. Um, happy customers are looking to create value for their organization through whatever they're buying from you and the services yeah. that you're providing. Neither of which can happen if your employees are not are not doing a good job. So where I really think like building this muscle memory is so important is in how you cultivate people and how those people do their jobs. Great companies have great employees and are built on the backs of strong teams. So uh, that's really how I think about it. And I think that if you can drive from that angle with a talent first attitude and get rid of, especially as a founder or CEO, get rid of the pride of ownership, get um, you, when your drive to win as a team becomes stronger than your ego, you are going to position yourself for a better, uh, quicker and, 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 and higher levels of success. I love that, man. And how do you, um, one of the questions I have, because everyone says, right, I hear this a lot. And, you know, the you know, surround yourself with smart people, right? Like surround yourself with smart people. It all works out. How do you get there? Right? Because I get, I, I'm not going to guarantee, but I'm going to guess that there's been times where you're like, this is a smart person I'm surrounding myself with. And then they get into the job and you're like, oh, shit. <laughs> like this is, yeah. this person is not adding the flour. I thought I got flour and it was really extra baking soda. You know, look, this our cornstarch. It looked the same, but you know, like how yeah. do you, how do you really think about, like, how do you make that practical? Cause I know, look, as a leader and I know lots and lots and lots of leaders and even people that manage teams that, you know, you, you everyone thinks they hire rock stars and, you know, people that are smarter than them, but you know, how do you, how do you bat at a higher average to find those types of folks? Yeah, I think one, it's about bringing, and this is kind of a, a compounding issue because you have to have other smart people to execute on what I'm saying. So when you're going for smart person, number one, your risk is higher, but <laughs> having, having multiple people during your interview processes, um, it, because you're going to get that perspective. Hey, I really like Steve because of X, or I like Jake better yeah. than Steve because of Y. And so having the right amount of people, the right amount of interviews and, and betting, um, and then not only doing like interview styles, I think that you, you got to do, we call it the beer test. It could be the coffee test or whatever, but like, I'm really big off of, uh, or on, uh, on meeting people in person. Like uh, we have one executive candidate for a role we're hiring and, uh, we're all flying 
flying out to meet on next Wednesday just to meet for lunch. And like, it's an important thing. Like people need to be able to connect with us on the cultural level right. as well as on the business level. So how do you determine that risk. real quick before, before yep. Steve, like the culture piece in particular, you know, I feel like this, this is where I feel some, a lot of times bias can come in. Right. It's like, cause it's like, you know, we have a, you know, we, we like people like us, you know, as well. Like how, how do you, how do you think about, or how does your team talk about, looking for culture and, 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 and also making sure that it's not kind of their own biased version of culture to some extent. Mm -hmm. Like how, yep. how do you guys, how do you guys think? And maybe it is a gut feel like that's cool. Like, you know, just, but how do you guys think about it? Huh. And, and it's a great question. Um, and there's a lot of different inputs that, that come into play on how we talk about this internally and driving culture. But I think it comes down to like one, like when we think about the culture of the business, it, from my lens, it's, is this somewhere that I still want to work, right? <laughs> like, for, let's start with that that question first. And if it is, why why do I want to work here? Well, you know what? I really like the team. I get along with sure. them. They resonate with me. They it's a fun environment. But I think that driving really good culture and building it start you start to develop on organizational health topics like really creating strong layers of vulnerability and trust between your team. Like, I'm not good at everything, and I need to be able to admit when I'm when I drop the ball somewhere and um, I need to be able to trust my, let's say my CTO that he's going to take the ball and run with it and, and really manage in, you know, his domain in the business. When you can really start to, to increase your organizational health, um, a lot of that culture starts to, to, to come out of it. And yes, there's, there's other yeah. things people do like, you know, the bring your dog to, to work day and stuff. It's yeah, not yeah, so much yeah. about that to us as it is about people really wanting to be in the role where they're at with the company that they're at. And I think when you do yeah. that, it, it kind of, it, the culture starts to shake itself out and it's built from everyone around you. It cannot be a dictatorship saying, this is what our culture is. Totally. It has to be a, almost a living, changing organism along, along the way you scale. I agree a hundred percent. Yeah. It's someone again is a CEO too. And I, I just, it's, you know, culture is working when you're not in it, you know, it's like, it's, the people that kind of coalesce and tend to get hired, et cetera, like, um, and bit, but also being intentional about creating space for the culture to, to kind of take shape, I think is, is from a leadership standpoint, that's how I look at a lot of it is just yep. creating the space. Not like you said, like, you know, I call it, uh, I think in the pandemic, there's a lot of mandatory fun. Uh, you know, it's like, <laughs> like you know, like sign up for this thing, do this. And yeah. I think a lot of companies in the remote world are struggling, you know, still with like the culture piece. So anyway, so going back to it, talking about rounding out kind of a team and like, how do you know that you're surrounding yourself with smart people? You, you started to talk about, hey, make sure that they're a culture fit. And I kind of, you know, jumped to the culture piece. But what are the other things? So what else do you do to make sure like, hey, this person is a, uh, you know, a, a, a smart person or like, you know, are there things that you do you guys do during the interview process other than, you know, like, like just those pieces? There are some, you know, you could take some of like the um, personality tests that are out there sure. and try, you know, there's stuff like that, but I think, it, it, and we do use and leverage some of that type of stuff, but really it comes down to them talking to multiple people on the team and, and trying to figure out if somebody is, you could take someone who's very, very smart, like you mentioned earlier, put them in a role where you think they're going to fit, and then they don't. We've had a couple of those happen. I mean, we've had somebody join the team at a pretty high level that within the first two days, I have uh, their direct boss calling me and saying, oh, shit, like, I think that we have some red flags that it's just not like <laughs> that we didn't see during the interview process. So. Uh, you know, yeah. you don't always you don't always hit, but you get as close as you can to it. And I think that another piece is, and for all of the people who want to build a business where you go venture back or private equity or some stage in between, like picking and choosing who your investors are, as much as they're picking and choosing what companies they want to work with, can be crucial to the success of of like talent building. It can be crucial to hiring phase, getting that operational support. Um, from let's say someone on the op side or or inside of one of the funds saying hey you know i'll I'll pick on mickey from from telescope partners i'll call mickey and i'll say he, he's <laughs> the the founder there um i'll say hey you know what i have this candidate i'm interviewing can you can you spend 30 minutes with them and like 
after a 20 year career in, in private equity and venture capital, like he knows what that role looks like in technology pretty well. And, and um, getting an opinion from somebody like that can be, can be vital to the success of, of, especially when you're attracting, you know, top tier talent. Yeah. I think that that's a great call out. I think again, for a lot of people out there, and it, it also sounds like, again, like you guys are good at kind of understanding like who's a fit um, immediately, but um, yeah, I mean, you're going to miss and you're going to hit home runs. And I guess it's, it's a kind of an interesting thing. You know, I don't know. I think a lot about you know, how you build out a leadership team in particular, like you said, it, it really does. Um, it really is kind of like that, that moment where things really start to take off. And, you know, for anyone out there, I think sometimes as a founder or CEO, even if you have your know, co-founder, um, just some of the things that you've talked about here, I think are both, you know, practical and tactical. So it's, it's great. So, so, you know, as soon as we kind of wrap up here for a little bit, um, you like, what's new for you, man? Like we always kind of like wrap up with just like, what's new, exciting for you. Like we've kind of talked about your origin story. We've talked a little bit about your, you know, kind of how you've built such a, you know, rock solid company and, you know, the, the learnings along the way. What's next? You know, what are the things that you're excited about, you know, for, for your next chapter? Yeah, um, great question. And, and so if you were to ask me this five years ago, I would have answered it differently, right? And, and, and rightfully so. But when we were building MedTrainer, I always thought, like, let's get to, let's, let's take this company to where it's worth $100 million and then, you know, look for an exit. And then, and then the question was like, uh, we got there. It's like, well, let's get to the next level and then look for, and, and so like, what's new? What am I looking forward to? Like, the DNA of the company, although the same, it's become so fun to to build this business. And like, I, I'm not going anywhere uh, anytime soon. Like my, my, I have very, very strong opinions and, and layers of conviction that have uh, led me to, to, to really drive a message to my team that like, I thought this was going to be a hundred million dollar company someday. Like now I truly believe we're going to build this to a multi-billion dollar company someday. Um, we just need to push through, you know, we are not, um, we're, we're highly efficient and we just are off of our new round of funding from our series B and we got a lot of work to do. So like in flight right now, I'm super excited about, you know, seeing the next phases of the business at scale and seeing all the new people that are coming to join our team as we grow. And then, um, you know, after that, like on the, well, during that, I guess on the personal side, I'm, I'm super excited about a lot of stuff going on in my personal life, watching my kids grow up, being able to spend more time with them as we get, like the more talented people I add to the leadership layers in the organization, the more freedom and time that it, it can free up for it, not to say like, oh, now I'm not working. Right. But I, I get to pick <laughs> and choose a little differently to than I did five years ago, totally. right? Where I wanted to spend my time. So I'm I'm excited for that kind of version of my career, and also excited to to uh, to really see myself scale more. I spend a lot of time with the mentorship groups that I had mentioned, and and that's very intentional by design. I try to be pretty prescriptive on where my strengths and weaknesses are, and and gauge to those throughout the year and really work on developing myself too, because I'm not the same CEO yeah. I was when I did Waste Stream Solutions. I'm not the same CEO that I was five years ago. That's right. And I think for a lot of people listening, just understand to get to build this team out, it, you know, this is nine, this is nine plus years in, right? It doesn't, uh, it doesn't happen overnight. I see some people are like, yeah, I'm just going to build up the team. And so it's like, yeah, like you can do that, but you're also probably going to need to like do some of the work, you know, like you're going to have to roll up your sleeves early on. And over time, you know, these things shake out. I've got a seven-year-old, uh, son uh so i can definitely relate with a lot of what you're saying too so uh it's a fun time it's a fun age we just uh yeah. had a basketball game last night and he's getting good so it's fun to watch awesome yeah super yeah, fun man yeah you know how it goes so cool yep. man well look hey steve a big thank you man i think you know for me i think there's gonna be a ton of takeaways for our listeners here um just about like your journey and i think like your attitude and specifically you know kind of how you've really leveraged mentorship you know to to like some next level like like the way that you look at mentorship i feel like is like the master's class so anybody who's you know interested in scaling a business and how to use mentors i think they can reference this episode and really you know it'll be a an insightful one for them so steve thank you so much for joining man i really appreciate it thanks jake i appreciate it thanks for having me on all right. Thank you again, man. Uh, and thank all of you for joining us today. Uh, and we will see you next week on the Jake Dunlap Show. 
All right. Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in to another extremely fun and interesting episode. I thought it was fun and interesting, so I hope you did too, of the Jake Dunlap Show. Uh, Really great just breaking down everything that makes people who they are, the success, the trials and errors, and I hope that you enjoyed it as much as I did. Make sure to subscribe on your favorite platform and make sure more than anything to go over to jakedunlap.com. That's where you're going to stay up to date on all the latest guests, additional details, prep notes. We're going to be sharing everything on jakedunlap.com. So go ahead, go over there. You can subscribe there as well too. And we will see you next week on the Jake Dunlap Show.